Does anyone remember how good the second Minions movie was? If you were to ask the average cartoon enjoyer nowadays what they think about the Minion movies, chances are the words stupid, childish, and cringe would be said a lot. But I watched these things recently and turns out they're not that bad at all, actually. People are so quick to dismiss these movies as brainless Zoomer humor that most don't even bother giving them an actual chance. I mean, I watched the first one already and that one wasn't that good, to be honest, but this video is about the second one, which is just a lot better, okay? Just trust me. Considering this movie came out only two years ago, I'm sure most of you remember its story, but what most people fail to remember is all the intricate themes that are backed up by legitimately solid writing for once. Choosing to tell a story about betrayal, family, and even following your dreams. Now don't get me wrong, okay, this movie still has a lot of haha minion goofy. There's literally an entire scene where the minions commit high-profile terrorism and hijack a plane full of passengers, but it's the way those scenes are executed that make this film truly underrated. So as I usually do on the channel, I'll be watching and recapping the second minions movie in full while completely overanalyzing the little things that don't really matter and giving my own opinions here and there. I know I've got high praise for a movie about possibly the most annoying characters in media history, but just trust me, I'm positive this video will surprise you. So grab your copy of Beautiful Joe for the Nintendo GameCube, and let's jump into what some call an emotional journey, Minions, The Rise of Gru. But first, before we get into the movie for today, I want to talk about something really important, mental health. It's a topic that's close to my heart because, well, I've been there. A few years back, I was in a rough spot mentally. I was stressed out with university and I was working nonstop. And on top of all that, I've always struggled with my self-confidence, to be honest. I felt like I wasn't happy with where I was in life and I started withdrawing, not wanting to burden my loved ones. It was a tough time for me. And although I'm in a better headspace now, no one is immune to mental health, okay? I still fight my own battles all the time. For me, the hardest part about reaching out has always been the limited access. Having to wait weeks, sometimes even months to talk to a professional can be super discouraging. And on top of that, sometimes I just didn't want to leave the house. This is where BetterHelp, today's sponsor, comes in handy. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. To get started, just visit betterhelp.com slash Darzy, answer a few questions, and you'll be matched usually within 48 hours to a therapist tailored to your needs. You can do it all via phone call, video chat, or even messaging, however you feel most comfortable, to be honest. It's easy, it's convenient, and you can do it all from home. Whether you've been through therapy or considering it for the first time, taking that first step could change everything. Let BetterHelp connect you to a therapist by visiting betterhelp.com slash Darzy or choose Darzy during sign up and enjoy a very special discount on your first month. Genuine reminder, you don't have to face these things alone. Our adventure begins with, get this, something completely unrelated to the minions at all. And just like that, the movie is already better than the original. We start by following one of the main villains in this story. She's riding her motorcycle around town when all of a sudden the anti-villain league shows up and tries to arrest her. There's like two or three police vehicles and a handful of AVL agents in this scene. And it still only takes a whopping 25 seconds for the villain to get away entirely. <laughs> Turns out the villain's name is Bellbottom. Very clever. She wears Bellbottom pants and stole some sort of map, I guess, is why the AVL was after her. Also, turns out she's part of a famous villain group called the Vicious Six. Not to be mistaken for the Fantastic Four, or the Furious Five, or the Sinister Six, or the Seven. Wow, there's a lot of these groups, actually. Anyway, a quick introduction to everyone in this evil group. There's Stronghold, he's very strong. There's Nunchuck, she's a nun with nunchucks. Is everyone's name in this group a horrible pun? There's John claude His name is a reference to Jean Claude, I'd imagine. And he's got a giant claw, obviously. There's a guy named Svengens, who has to be Swedish or else this pun doesn't make any sense. And then there's Wild Knuckles, who's the leader of the group and has that name because he punches stuff sometimes. I don't know, his name doesn't really fit him all that well. I'm gonna be honest. You will become the most powerful villains in the world. Why is it always the old dude that leads these groups? Wait, he's in his mid 70s? I guess there also is a nun in the group, so. Whatever. Anyway, the map they stole ends up leading them to some special amulet that when activated, gives everyone special powers. At least that's what I think it does. I don't think they actually ever tell us what the thing does. It's just like super shiny, so it must be important, I guess. The map leads them to this very big, very obvious temple with two giant dragon statues. Surely someone could have found this without the map, but that's fine. And honestly, hold up. If you look at the map, it doesn't really even tell you that much information. Like, yeah, man, look for trees, <laughs> I guess. I promise this movie's good. Okay, we just got to get through this intro. Bear with me. Wild Knuckles enters the place completely completely alone, which is super weird and kind of sus. This guy's like super old. Why would they not send backup to go with him? Thankfully though, he does find the amulet right away, which is what he was looking for, obviously. But of course, it's never that easy. So a bunch of random monsters spawn in and are waiting for him as he's leaving the temple. There's like a million of these things and they're all kind of tiny and kind of yellow. So I thought it would have been a cool idea if these things tied into the minions somehow in some way, but no, we never see these guys ever again. Anyway, so Wild Knuckles is straight up about to die when finally the rest of the vicious six show up to save him. As they're flying away, you'll never see this coming the group decides to turn on Wild Knuckles, taking the amulet from him and cutting the rope so he falls to his death. Wow! 
alone. So because the Vicious Six turned on Wild Knuckles, you might think it actually makes sense to send him into the temple alone. But if I'm being honest, wanting to backstab him in the end might have been a better reason to actually go with him. Like what if he just didn't succeed in getting the amulet? How long until you find another person to go in there for you? It's probably better to go in with like three or four of you and make sure you can get the amulet 100%. Anyway, after this scene of betrayal, which definitely won many, many Oscars, we finally cut to the minions. Wait, still no minions? Are you sure? This next scene is actually centered around Gru. He's just a child in this movie and still has a lot to prove. I'm pretty sure this movie takes place right after the first Minions movie, but it might skip a year or two. Honestly, it doesn't matter that much. I'm not looking it up because I don't want to. Gru is in school and his teacher is asking everyone what they want to be when they grow up. We get some normal answers like a firefighter and a teacher, but when it's Gru's turn, he answers that he wants to become a super villain. I want to be a super villain. <laughs> Everyone in class starts laughing at him like he's the only one with gold armor in Minecraft or something. But in a world where very real supervillains exist, do you think this answer would like raise some alarms or something? At the very least, the teacher has to have some obligation to like report this to someone. I mean, come on, lady, he's gonna steal the moon. Anyway, the bell rings and everyone is greeted by their parents picking them up. However, because Gru basically has no father and his mother is emotionally abusive and extremely neglectful, the people picking Gru up are actually the minions. Excluding title sequences, this minions movie took around eight minutes to show the very first minion on screen. You might think that's a bad thing. I promise you, it's not. <laughs> Did you just spank him? Isn't he a child? Why does this movie always do that? The next part of Gru's day is just him having fun with some minions. They go to a theater and cut the line so they can enter without buying their tickets. Hold up. Editor Darzy here. I'm pausing the video because I noticed something in editing. There's a sticker on the glass that says this show is sold out. It's obviously referring to a movie because this is a theater. I just wanted to bring that up because I sometimes call movies shows and people seem to get really mad by it sometimes. But this show did it too. So there you go. Once in the movie room, they straight up use Viper's ult from Valorant, and then everyone leaves because there's gas everywhere and they don't want to die. Gru then watches the rest of the movie with a gas mask on, which is probably more annoying than a crowded room, but to each their own. Also, the minions don't wear any masks because they're actually invincible to every kind of harm imaginable. Watch my video on the first movie to find out more. The gang then goes to an arcade where they just cheat a lot. The point is that they're just doing like kid villain stuff. There's honestly something kind of sweet seeing Gru and the minions doing these harmless little things as opposed to trying to take over the world all the time. It's just a nice change. I don't know. I like it. I also have to mention the ice cream shop scene where the movie references the opening shot from the very first Despicable Me movie. Cheese ray. Cheese ray. Oh, it's like the first movie, except this time it's cheese for some reason. <laughs> this is when Gru finally gets home and sees that he has a package in the mail. Turns out it's a cartridge from the Vicious Six. It's even got Wild Knuckles' face scratched off, so they must have just sent this out and paid extra for Amazon's premium shipping option. Holy Turns out Gru sent an application in a while ago to join the Vicious Six, so this cartridge plays a recording of Bell Bottom letting Gru know that the group is impressed and that Gru has an interview tomorrow at noon. What happens if Gru doesn't get this job? Does the Vicious Six just take him out on the spot? This seems like a weird job to have an interview for. <laughs> and of course, because this is a silly cartoon, after the message is played, it blows up. Also, one of the minions starts puffing rings with the toxic fumes of the explosion. It's actually crazy. Gru enters the house and there's this quick bit about how his mom sleeps with a bunch of men and doesn't take care of her child. It's honestly super weird. She's probably just mad she was born with a crimson chin. Anyway, Gru then goes to the basement, which is where the minions are building the secret lair. It's a pretty small space, but everyone's gotta start somewhere. Okay, guys, he's only 12 years old. He'll get proper storage for his nukes eventually. Now, I gotta say, so far, this movie actually is pretty interesting. It hasn't relied on the minions too much so far, which is actually kind of a breath of fresh air, but this next part is a little weird. We see this minion get torched by a flamethrower, which is normal. We've already established these guys can't die, but then as Gru is telling everyone about the interview tomorrow, we see this larger minion step up named Otto. He's visually different than the rest. He has braces on, and like I said, we know his name. It's Otto. His name is Otto. I'll say it now. Otto plays a big part in this movie, but as far as I know, he doesn't show up in any other movie in the entire franchise. He's not in the first three Despicable Me movies, anyway. So, like, what happens to this guy? Does he go missing or something? Has anyone spotted this guy? Anyone seen him at all? Otto just keeps yapping, and everyone is kind of annoyed. So, the next day now, and Gru is getting ready for his big day. Of course, this is an Illumination movie, so we get the mandatory butt shot for some reason. And as he's about to leave, Gru runs into the minions and lets them know that he wants to do this whole interview thing on his own. This movie has a weird dynamic where Gru hasn't really bonded with the minions yet. Gru thinks of the minions as these disposable level one crooks. And then the minions, having negative 10 emotional awareness at all times, feel a little betrayed because they thought everyone was one big happy family, I guess. Bad news for you, this is an animated movie released in 2022. Finding love and care in one of these things is extremely hard to find. Gru ends up going to the record shop, which I guess is a cover for the Vicious Six's headquarters. So good. Oh, you're good. My mistake. You're good, my mistake. Please don't eat me. <laughs> Who just growls at a kid like that? 
<laughs> this is when Gru meets the man at the front desk, who's actually a young Dr. Nefario. This is actually a really cool scene because we know how everything ends up between these two, and this is the very beginning of that. At least that's what I would have said if we didn't see them already meeting in the background of the first Minions movie. Yep, that's right. They already met, and it was off camera. How wonderful. Anyway, Nefario is working as a cover-up for the Vicious Six. Gru tells him why he's there, and he gets led to a secret elevator, which brings him to the basement. It's here when Gru sits down next to some much bigger, much older guys who actually look really evil. One of them is reading an edition of Mad Magazine, which after some research, I found released in January of 1961. This movie takes place in 1976, so the Vicious Six really need to update their waiting room reading material. Seriously, this thing is older than Gru is. Anyway, Gru enters the main room with all the main villains and tries to talk to them, but the Vicious Six are confused, because he's just a child, but they said earlier in the recording that they were impressed by Gru's resume. So how did they have no idea that Gru was 12 years old? Like his previous education section probably said kindergarten or something, whatever. And of course I'm ragging on this movie a bit unprovoked. The truth is, so far this Minions movie is a lot more about Gru and the villains than it is the Minions, which I would actually like to commend Illumination for. It actually feels more like a Despicable Me movie so far, to be honest. Anyway, there's some silly shenanigans that happen and all the villains get distracted, which is when Gru, who just got rejected for being a child, decides to steal the the amulet that the Vicious Six got at the very beginning of the movie. The villains find out what's going on, but because this is a prequel and Gru still has a lot of villainy to do, they fail miserably at catching him. Bruh. Gru runs out of the store, which is when we see Wild Knuckles spying on him. I forgot to mention this, but Wild Knuckles isn't actually dead. He drank a chug jug earlier and is now back to full health. Gru still needs to get away from everyone, however, so he's about to get on his bike, but turns out some of the minions followed him all the way to the record shop. This isn't too bad, but Gru gets annoyed because Otto is one of the minions here and he really just wants to punch him in the face. We get an epic chase scene where where all the expert villains are bested by 12 year olds. And of course, the most interesting and perhaps most tragic part about all of this is that at one point, Gru drops the amulet, so he's forced to distract the villains while Otto is left solely responsible in getting the amulet safely home. Surely nothing bad will happen. This guy is reliable, right? Well, the movie wastes no time because the next shot is Gru with his minions asking Otto for the amulet. However, when Otto gives it to him, it's not actually the amulet at all, but actually a rock with some googly eyes or something. I wish I was kidding. <laughs> Bro, is, this, are you is that a rock? How know. thick are Otto's glasses, oh. man? There's this long story told by Otto where he willingly trades the amulet to some random girl for the rock, but there's no real reason for him to make that trade at all other than like, he's an idiot, I guess. He tells the whole story in the gibberish minion language that isn't a real language. No one in the real world speaks minionese. I don't care if there's real words mixed in there. But yeah, Otto is really stupid and ruined everyone's day. Of course. Gru ends up being really angry, so he fires everyone. And then the minions get really sad because they basically put all their stock into Gru as a leader. A little later, and while Gru is leaving the house, one of the minions sees him getting kidnapped. Side note, I'm pretty sure every single installment of this franchise has had some sort of kidnapping scene. Not sure if it means anything. It's a pretty wild coincidence. The person who kidnapped Gru ends up actually being Wild Knuckles. I guess he wants the amulet from him because he saw everything go down earlier. But when Gru doesn't actually have it, he straight up threatens to kill him and then proceeds to torture him with sleep deprivation, which I'm pretty sure is like a war crime or something. To save himself, Gru ends up calling the minions for help. So the idea here is that Otto is now tasked with finding the amulet himself because he's the one who lost it, while the other three main minions travel to San Francisco to try to save Gru. Yeah, Gru is in San Francisco now, by the way. Wild Knuckles lives there, I guess. Well, we can't have the minions walking all the way over there by foot. That would take way too long. Oh, what's that? What about the bikes that are actually straight up rocket ships? Yeah, those are pretty boring. How about we just hijack a plane? Yep, I'm not kidding. The minions put on some pilot uniforms and actually hijack an entire plane with living, breathing passengers inside it. I'm almost positive this is considered some form of domestic terrorism, but I guess their heart's in the right place and they're kind of cute, so I'll give them a pass. This scene is really funny though. You should watch it all if you can find it on YouTube or something. So they end up landing the plane completely fine. They must play a lot of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Eventually, they find the address Gru is at, but when they sneak in, they get caught and chased off the property by some guards. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is actually kind of funny when it's not shoving fart jokes in your friggin' face every two minutes. This is when the minions get cornered because they're very small and very weak. But then, out of nowhere, this random massage therapy lady comes out and saves them with her kung fu abilities. Her appearance makes almost zero sense here, but this movie's made me laugh and given me an actual story to be invested in, so... I'll let it slide. The bad guys end up running away, which is when the minions realize they need to learn Kung Fu themselves so they can enter the house Gru is in and save him. They end up asking the nice lady for Kung Fu lessons, which is weird. After some back and forth, however, the lady does eventually agree to train them. I want to mention real quick that this character is voiced by Michelle Yeoh. It's nothing like super special, but I want to mention it because I love her and she's kind of goaded as hell. There's a lot of training in the next couple scenes. We see these three minions go from completely incompetent to kind of understanding some things about 
without fighting, maybe? Listen, they're still kind of goofy idiots, but the nice lady teaches them to play to their strengths, which at least gives them the confidence to go save Gru. Also, during this, the villains... Remember them? <laughs> Almost forgot about them, to be honest. Well, they had some scenes where they showed off all their super cool custom cars. It's like a GTA 5 garage or something. They end up going to Gru's house, but obviously he's not there. They find out he's in San Francisco somehow, so they decide to make their way there now. Riveting storytelling. We also get some auto plot line stuff. He basically finds the amulet somehow. It's not really important how he does it, he just does. And is now making his own way to San Francisco towards Gru and his boys. Much like my critiques of Despicable Me 3, you might think I'd get a little annoyed by all the different stories going on in this movie at the same time. It feels like there's a lot of back and forth here between the characters. But what this movie actually does right is that it doesn't give every character the same amount of screen time. The less important aspects of the story are only on screen for a little while, whereas someone like Gru, who eventually gets untied from his literal torture device, subsequently gets a lot more time on screen. He's free to move around now and develop his character again. Let's focus on him. Great idea. It's little things like that that make this movie more enjoyable to watch, in my opinion. Sure, it's not perfect, but it's the closest thing we've had to it in like 10 years, so I'll take what I can get. <laughs> so like I breezed over earlier, Gru actually got freed by Wild Knuckles. The reason for this is the henchman got beat up by the massage girl earlier, remember? So now Wild Knuckles has no one to do the chores around the house, so he needs Gru to do them. I'm not kidding. What's important to note though is that there's a moment where Gru saves Wild Knuckles' life from some sharks at one point. Stay with me. And so Wild Knuckles kind of has a change of heart. This part actually happens pretty quick, but whatever. The two bond over being evil and stuff, and eventually Wild Knuckles agrees to mentor Gru for a little bit. It's oddly sweet, and again, not something I thought I'd see in a Minions movie out of all places. The two even do a little bank heist together, you know, as you do while hanging out with the boys. This is actually the very same bank from the Despicable Me movie. It's cool because we get to see the OG bank owner and even a picture of Vector. This scene doesn't mean anything for the story itself, but since we see a childhood photo of Vector in this movie, it means that in Despicable Me, Vector is around the same age as Gru, which would put him at around 45 to 50 years old. Not sure if this was just like an oversight on the writer's part, but yeah, Vector just has a baby face, I guess. Ugh, he looks weird. <laughs> he does look weird, I agree. Someone commented the other day that I look like Vector. That guy. After robbing the bank in world record pace, the two return home to find it completely wrecked. Turns out the Vicious Six visited earlier and just destroyed the entire house. Wild Knuckles gets super sad because the people he trusted the most basically ruined his life. We then get this scene where Gru tries to gas Wild Knuckles up, and we get probably the most wholesome line from a kid who's just trying to help. Hey, you are a great bad guy. And they are stupid idiots. Like, he's actually great in this show. I love Gru now. <laughs> Although Gru does his best to motivate, he ends up missing his quick time event, so Wild Knuckles gets mad and tells him to leave him alone. Out of options now, Gru walks away, which is when he randomly meets up with Otto, who has the amulet around his neck and is in San Francisco. Did I mention that already? I forget. He's in San Francisco now. But before they can do anything, the Vicious Six appear and actually steal the amulet back right away. Thankfully, the Anti-Villain League shows up with Silas Ramsbottom, my favorite character of all time. I'll never forget his name. But then, their efforts are completely wasted because the Vicious Six then utilizes the power of the amulet finally so we can actually find out what this thing does. A bit of magic happens and I guess it turns the villains into giant animals slash mythical creatures like they turn into giant snakes, bulls, and tigers and then another one just turns into a dragon out of nowhere. Seems pretty random. At the very least it's very colorful and makes my brain happy I guess. The dragon lady then ties Gru up to the giant clock in a way that would basically snap his bones once a couple minutes have passed. This marks the second time in this Minions movie that a child Gru got tied up and tortured these movies are actually insane. <laughs> This is actually a really cool fight scene. The three kung fu minions show up finally, but are turned into animals almost right away. Thankfully, they can still fight, even though they're animals. And then, with the help of none other than Wild Knuckles himself, the four fight off all the bad guys. I guess Wild Knuckles took a five-hour energy and had a change of heart. How nice. I'll mention this fact again, but the minions are actually invincible and cannot feel any pain. This has been proven multiple times throughout the franchise. I somehow really doubt they're gonna lose this fight. <laughs> the moment. Jeez, that was kind of like a jump scare. That was like some Five Nights at Freddy's lore or something. Using their expert kung fu skills and thanks to Otto's persistence in helping Gru, everything is looking good. That is, until Wild Knuckles sadly gets burnt to a crisp in front of our very own eyes and it actually dies. R.I.P. W.K. You probably only had like five years left to live anyway. The minions all yell together and it does something crazy apparently and then Gru uses the amulet that he somehow got back and turns the vicious six into a bunch of rats. The day is saved, Gru officially rehires his minions and everything can go back to normal. 
We then skip ahead to Wild Knuckles' funeral. I'm not kidding. Gru is giving a beautiful speech while the minions sing the most angelic choir music known to man. But it's actually very sad, and Gru cries a lot, and honestly, I kind of feel for him. But then, in the happiest twist in movie history, turns out Wild Knuckles isn't dead at all, and the whole burnt alive thing just didn't happen. Or something. <laughs> That's not explained. Doesn't matter. Gru finds out that Wild Knuckles is still alive and is super happy now. What's weird is that we never see Wild Knuckles ever again in any other movie, so as far as I know, maybe he actually does die soon after this. I honestly have no idea. Shoot for the moon, kid. Shoot for the moon. Get it? Because he literally shoots for the moon in the first movie. That's such a good line. Oh, that was actually good. What the f And that was the movie, Minions, The Rise of Gru. Why was it actually kind of good, though? I guess everyone surrounding the production of this movie was tired of the Minion slander and decided it was time to lock in and release a banger. Now, again, don't get me wrong. This isn't some five-star masterpiece that'll be displayed in the Louvre or anything. But by Illumination standards, and especially for a family movie, this was actually really good. Decent writing, decent pacing, and just not having the Minions be a part of every single scene really helped this movie a lot. And I mean, like, really really, really help this movie. <laughs> it's a really fun watch, and at the end of the day, that's all anyone really wanted, right? But yeah, that's the end of the video. Become a member for only a single dollar if you'd like your name here to be viewed by thousands on every video. It also directly supports me, which I am extremely grateful for. I'll have member-exclusive content eventually, so if that interests you, go ahead. Like and comment, all that stuff if you want to help me out. I'll be watching Despicable Me 4 soon, and then I'll be done with this franchise, which is very exciting. <laughs> I won't lie. <laughs> Paula Abdul scores this one a solid, vicious 6 out of 5. And yeah, Thanks for watching. Tichanou Kung Fu, Bors Smoochie Smoochie, Pantera! <laughs>